And now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for this evening, Dr. James <coughs> Gentry. Dr. Gentry joined the faculty of our department in September last year, coming to us from the University of Virginia. Uh, we did some of his early training also at George Mason University and then Harvard, where he completed his PhD. After that, he worked for almost five years at Kathmandu University, Nepal in the Ranjun Yeshe Institute, before returning to the United States. Dr. Gentry specializes in the study of Tibetan Buddhism, whose well-known complexity he will be addressing this evening, and maybe even simplifying for us, I'm not sure. Um, uh, James's interests are wide-ranging, and his writings include the book Power Objects in Tibetan Buddhism, the life writings and legacy of uh, Sokdokpa Lodra Gyeltsen, the title of which already hints at the fact that, among other things, his research addresses itself to material culture, literature, biography, and history. Dr. Gentry has also been active as a translator of Buddhist texts, and for two years was editor-in-chief of the 84,000 project, which um, some of you will know, an ambitious international undertaking to translate the entire Tibetan Buddhist canon into English, and a number of his own translations form part of this massive endeavor. He is also currently engaged into research into various aspects of the development of the meditation culture of Tibetan Tantrism, and it is from this project that some of the material for tonight's talk is drawn. Its title is Simplicity and Elaboration in Buddhist Theory and Practice, Points of Friction in the Tantric Profile of the Great Perfection. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming James Gentry to the podium. Thanks everyone for showing up tonight, for appearing here despite the wonderful weather. <laughs> so um, I'd like to first thank the Ho Center for Buddhist Studies, its uh, Tibetan Studies Initiative, the Department of Religious Studies, and the Center for South Asia for sponsoring and organizing uh, this event here. Um, my talk today will consider the relationship between simplicity and elaboration in Buddhist traditions and Tibet's great perfection tradition in particular. So I will consider this topic through the lens of a short, great perfection tantra called The Only Child of the Buddhas. It's associated literature in the broader context of its production and reception. But before I get into that, um, I'd like to first briefly touch upon what I mean by simplicity and elaboration in Buddhist theory and practice, and what I imagine to be at stake in examining their relationship in the great perfection. For those of you who read the description of this talk, uh, slightly elaborate, I'd have, I'd have to say. Um, <laughs> you must have observed that the complexity there stands for, and I quote my own description, the mainstream tantric visualizations, Baroque ceremonials, and demanding physical postures connected with deity yoga and subtle body practices. And by simplicity, I primarily have in mind, and here, this is from my own description again, the non-dual nature of intrinsic awakened cognition. This is a particularly tantric expression of a dynamic that runs through most Buddhist traditions. Buddhist traditions are often structured, as many of you probably already know, according to doctrinal pairings of the simple and the elaborate. So we have, for instance, the dyads of ultimate truth and relative truth, um, emptiness and dependent origination, Buddha nature and adventitious defilements, mind and phenomenal appearances, unconditioned wisdom and conditional merit, the wisdom that knows the singular nature of reality and the wisdom that perceives all that exists. And of course, in East Asian Buddhism, there's the famous formula, yin yang san tian, or the whole universe in a single thought. I could go on iterating more such dyads, uh, but I think you get the point after this list here. <laughs> and. Um, when it comes to questioning how these doctrinal formulas might relate to material culture, ritual action, mythic narratives, pragmatic religion, and the other messy stuff of lived traditions, textual scholars of tantric Buddhist traditions in Tibet, at least, have generally tended to shy away, although those with a more philosophical bent kind of go directly for these pairings and pretty much remain there throughout their, throughout their careers. And when the complexity of the tantric ritual world takes center stage, it has, as it has in more recent studies, 
its relationship with formulations about the simplicity of non-dual cognition, emptiness, Buddha nature, or the other doctrinal mainstays also tends to be neglected or treated only in passing. Now, the academic study of Tibet's great perfection tradition actually stands out as a caricature of this tendency in, in many respects to divide the simplicity of non-dual cognition from the complex rituals involving deities, mandalas, and the other elaborate stuff of tantric ritual and contemplative life. With few notable exceptions, scholarly and popular discussions of the great perfection have almost exclusively foregrounded doctrinal treatments of cognition at the expense of the rituals, the myths, the material culture, and so on that have been an integral part of great perfection traditions from their inception to the present. This lopsided emphasis on the mind and the mental has, I believe, helped enable the progenitors of the modern mindfulness movement to co-opt great perfection contemplative techniques, dislodging them from their, their traditional moorings and the promotion of a kind of non-judgmental bare awareness as a palliative for the dystopias of contemporary society. However, the relationship between simplicity and elaboration in the great perfection has actually been a dynamic one and the tensions between them have been productive of some of the most creative, doctrinal, and contemplative innovations in the history of Buddhism. My choice of the only child of the Buddhist Tantra as the lens through which to explore this dynamic is a strategic one. The only child of the Buddhas, as its title suggests, is itself a simplification of a much more elaborate world of texts, ideas, and practices. But it is also, in turn, uh, it, is, it, is, it has also in turn served as the basis for further textual elaboration in the form of commentaries and affiliated texts that instruct how to redact the Tantra into the form of a simple amulet and wear it. What is more, this Tantra explicitly theorizes the potency and the inevitability of the perpetual undulation between simplicity and elaboration, singularity and multiplicity, materiality and immateriality and so on, on a number of different registers. So this undulation, as I will try to show here, not only hints at the Tantra's historical role as a condensation of and germ for other teachings, it also mirrors the radiation and absorption of light, imagery, and sound typical of standard Tantric Buddhist deity yoga techniques. But this Tantra's relationship with Buddhas and deity yoga is an ambiguous one at best. The only child of the Buddhist Tantra courses with imagery highlighting reproductive and generative potency. It, it presents itself as the offspring of the Buddhas, and I'll show why and how uh, briefly. The only one, and it also positions itself as the generative matrix for the ongoing birth of future Buddhas and for Buddhist traditions as a whole. But as I hope to show, the only child of the Buddhas also has a very murky origin a complicated transmission history, and contains only vague outlines of the full range of tantric Buddhist practices to which it becomes attached through subsequent commentarial literature and associated texts. I will argue that it is by means of its rhetoric of undulation between simplicity and elaboration that it sets itself up to play a pivotal performative role in the continuity and spread of great perfection traditions. Much can be said about the relationship between simplicity and elaboration in the history of the great perfection. As I've already suggested, it is arguably the shifting roles of deities along with their mandala pure lands and the textual formulations and rituals that feature them that stands at the very center of tensions between simplicity and elaboration in this tradition. In the way of an outline of this talk, um, I'll start with a general background discussion of uh, the Great Perfection tradition, just to orient you to the place that this Tantra has within that tradition, and especially the seminal heart tradition of which it is a part. I'll then focus in on the Tantra itself, introducing first what is known about its origin and history of reception, before, getting into the t before uh, venturing some final uh, conclusions about uh, the relationship between simplicity and elaboration in, in this text, The Great Perfection Tradition, and what this can tell us about uh, that relationship in Buddhist traditions as a whole. So I'll start with an overview of a few key concepts that should help uh, contextualize the Tantra. Uh, first, to understand the role of deities in The Great Perfection, a little bit of general background is in order. 
So the origin and historical development of the great perfection vis-a-vis -vis mainstream Indian Buddhist Tantra has been a point of scholarly debate for some time now. Generally speaking, however, scholars agree that the great perfection or Dzogchen in Tibetan was first used in relation to key elements in the elaborate mandala rituals and contemplations typical of the 8th century Indian Buddhist tantric dispensation known as Maha Yoga or Great Yoga, particularly those derived from the elaborate 100 deity mandala that features in the Maha Yoga Tantra known as the Guhya Garbha Tantra. Both the Guya Garbha Tantra and the Great Perfection traditions it helps spawn are part of the old school of Buddhism in Tibet. So the old school of Tibetan Buddhism, for those who are not aware of this, uh, this nomenclature, is so designated because its adherents claim that its scriptures and lineages of practice and exegesis are the oldest in Tibet. The claim is that Tibetan old school lineages descend from Indian tantric Buddhist traditions whose texts, like the Guhya Garbha Tantra, were said to have been imported to Tibet and translated into the Tibetan language during the Tibetan imperial period. The Tibetan imperial period is roughly the 200 year period from about 650 to 850 common era when the Tibetan kings expanded their territory beyond the plateau, first began to sponsor the large scale importation of Buddhist traditions to Tibet and eventually made Buddhism the state religion of Tibet. After the collapse of the Tibetan Empire, Tibetans affiliated with these early lineages began to integrate and creatively adapt many of the subsequent developments in Indian Tantric Buddhism by means of a system of ongoing scriptural revelation. This tradition of ongoing re revelation became known in Tibet as the treasure tradition. The only child of the Buddhist Tantra is considered one such treasure revelation. In the treasure tradition, treasure revealers, who were all purported to be reincarnations of key figures active during the Tibetan imperial court, would reveal tantras such as the only child of the Buddhist Tantra, meditation manuals, liturgies, narratives, sacred objects, and sometimes entire territories that were said to have first been brought and or disclosed to the Tibetan imperial court during the height of the Tibetan imperial period by Indian tantric masters known as Vimalamitra and Padmasambhava, who were the main protagonists of this tradition, pictured here to the left. It's Vimalamitra to the left and Padmasambhava there below to the right. Um, they'll figure in later when I start to talk about the tantra and their relationship with this tantra. And, um, so uh, according to the treasure tradition, these tantric masters conceal their scriptures, objects, and territories for later prophecy disciples to reveal over the ensuing centuries when the time would be right for their revelation and propagation. This tradition of ongoing revelation is still very much part of the living traditions of Tibetan Buddhism today. We have uh, treasures being re revealed still, and so it's a uh, kind of uh, will continue probably as well. Later old school narratives relate that the teachings first taught and concealed before the fall of the Tibetan Empire in the middle of the 9th century were only revealed later beginning in the 11th century because the intervening 150 years or so was a period of darkness. That's kind of the, the terminology that you get in the tradition for this. Meaning that monastic Buddhism was not robustly practiced and cultural contact with Indian Buddhism was temporarily severed due to a lack of patronage. However, we have overwhelming evidence based on texts retrieved from the Dunhuang Cave Libraries and other early sources that the period from roughly 850 to 1100 was in fact a time of tremendous scriptural production in which tantric traditions continue to develop on Tibetan soil. Tibetan great perfection texts were first composed and great perfection communities incorporated Indian Buddhist tantric developments like the Yogini Tantras, which had gained prominence in India in the interim and were being translated into Tibetan starting around the year 1000. The rubric of the Great Perfection, which developed from roughly 850 to 1100, therefore was a very has a very complex history and includes a wide variety of distinct lineages, scriptures, and contemplative techniques. Overall, however, uh, Great Perfection traditions probably first emerged by simply foregrounding the singular nature of intrinsic non-dual cognition itself. In interpreting the import of the Kuhigarbha's elaborate mandala of 100 pacific and fierce deities. Usually people call that the, the peaceful and wrathful deities. But since that's a kind of subjective state, I've sort of 
tweaked it. They're the, usually the peaceful and wrathful deities, for those of you who have heard that expression. However, this seems to have never actually entailed the rejection of the mandala of the deities and the practices centering on it. It only entailed its resignification, in fact. Moreover, this great perfection resignification became more diversified as adherents began adapting and absorbing free features from the Kalachakra Tantra and other related tantric scriptures that appeared in Tibetan only in the early 11th century. The distinctive reinterpretation of the mandalas of 100, the mandala of 100 deities that resulted is probably most famous today for its central role in the bardo tudral, or liberation through hearing during the intermediate state, a treasure revelation said to be revealed in the 14th century by the Tibetan visionary Karma Lingpa. Here is a beautiful depiction of uh, the mandala, a little bit blurry, but actually that's not the quality of the image, it's the painting itself, in fact. Um, yeah. This treasure revelation came to, to more be known more popularly as the Tibetan Book of the Dead, pictured here after, after its pioneering translation and publication in 1927 by Walter Evans Wentz and his Tibetan informants, who he credits actually, strangely enough, <laughs> unlike his uh, contemporaries. Uh, pictured here also on the right, that's uh, Evans Wentz, who was actually a, a Stanford University graduate and the first person to introduce this Tibetan system of theory and practice to the West. However, despite its unique status in the history of Tibetology, Karma Lingpa's text is not actually very unique at all. It in fact represents only a sliver of a much larger body of theory and practice that had gained traction by as early as the 11th and 12th centuries to become the premier expression for how Tibet's old school traditions would integrate developments in Indian Buddhist Tantra with uniquely Tibetan innovations. This strain of the Great Perfection, which became the most influential Great Perfection tradition in the history of Buddhism in Tibet, is better known today as the Nyingtik tradition, which I'll translate as seminal heart after other popular translations of the term. The only child of the Buddha's tantra is part of this tradition. Now the seminal heart tradition traces its origin to a set of 17 tantras. These tantras are said to have reached the human realm via the visionary experience of a seventh century Indian adept whose historicity is shrouded in mystery, known only in Tibetan as Garab Dorje. Although lineage histories differ in their details, the tradition generally holds that Garab Dorje received these tantras directly from the Buddhas Vajrasattva and Vajrapani in a visionary encounter. Tradition has it that they were later brought to Tibet and translated into Tibetan in the 8th century by the Indian master Vimalamitra, who I pictured earlier. And he in turn concealed them to eventually be, re be rediscovered after a few sort of, you know, concealments and rediscoveries. It happened a few times. But eventually it was the 12th century uh, person by the name of uh, Shantun uh, Tashidorje who, who revealed them and kind of spread them without further concealment. The tradition also holds that these 17 tantras are in fact a distillation of 7,400,000 other tantras. So, th so these 17 are already a kind of simplification of a much more uh, elaborate, if you will, body of tantras that, that are supposedly still concealed somewhere in Kashmir. So that kind of speaks to the origin of some of the uh, um, practices connected with the Nintik literature or the seminal heart literature that we'll get into. Uh, from a philological perspective, these 17 tantras are probably 11th century Tibetan compositions, not translations, even as they might be, probably are, in fact, inspired by uh, earlier textual material. By the 14th century, the 17 tantras had developed an extensive commentarial literature and ritual repertoire, with commentaries of the main tantra alone, the penetrating sound tantra, counting over a thousand pages in length. Moreover, the popularity of the seminal heart extended well beyond the confines of the seminal heart literature itself and that commentarial literature. Um, so in fact, during the 14th century, as I alluded to earlier, the seminal heart inspired uh, the most voluminous revelatory scriptural output in the history of Tibet. The 14th century was really the heyday of the revel uh, revelation of massive collections. Um, all of them kind of partake of 
seminal heart inspired ideas and practices. So when summarizing the seminal heart's main doctrinal features, the seminal heart and its derivations are alike in combining the naturalistic rhetorical flavor typical of the burgeoning great perfection movements with elements from Maha Yoga and other later Indian tantric traditions to forge a number of innovative associations. Um, we'll see these innovations, how the, the, this, the tantra that I'm going to introduce fits into these innovations just shortly. But most saliently, we see in the seminal heart tradition a reinterpretation of deities, mantras, mudras, mandala palaces, and the rest as expressions of intrinsic non-dual gnosis, which serves at this, as the foundation of the dualistic universe and crystallizes in the very core of the psychophysical organism of beings. To be clear, the interiorization of tantric elements was already well underway in the Indian Buddhist tantras of the yogini class, where the seminal heart great perfection integration is unique is that it frames this notion in terms of novel theories of cosmogony, language, and embodiment that place gnosis and its dynamic creativity as the sole driving force behind all of phenomenal existence. The seminal heart and related traditions share the assumption that intrinsic non-dual gnosis, rather than ignorance, is the fundamental creative energy of the universe. So rather than propose that the universe and the person are produced by karmic processes, driven by ignorance, attachment, and aggression, as is common in most uh, Buddhist traditions, the seminal heart has it that everything in phenomenal existence is simply an expression of innate gnosis. The seminal heart tradition frames our current delusional dualistic situation monistically as a result of gnosis framed in terms of an originally pristine and undivided ground of being misrecognizing its own dynamic expressions of phenomenal reality as other than itself. This event of self-misrecognition is ambiguously described in cosmogonic, ontological, and epistemological terms. In other words, this act of misrecognition is portrayed as an event that happened in the distant past, as the primordial ground mistook the nascent self-expressions of beginningless and dynamic gnosis to be other than itself thereby giving rise to the dualistic world of birth, death, and suffering. And yet, this misrecognition is also portrayed as something happening each moment on the personal level as well, as we continue to misrecognize phenomenal experience as other than the dynamic self-expression of our own non-dual awakened cognition, and thereby perpetually give rise to the dualistic experience of a karmically driven world rife with conflict and exploitation. One main catch with this theory, of course, is the difficulty of explaining the pristine ground's original self-misrecognition. <laughs> Indeed, how could Gnosis become alienated from itself if that is all there is? And how could Gnosis be a causal condition for karma, even indirectly, when it is by definition unconditioned? The seminal heart tradition grapples with this question, or at least brings critical attention to it, by placing all condition and contrived techniques on the path under erasure. That is, it is careful to acknowledge their role in some sort of uh, restricted sense uh, and even incorporate them, but in so doing it either critiques or even negates their true efficacy to invoke unconditional gnosis or it reinterprets them significantly in this light. The seminal heart thus emphasizes that the natural, the spontaneous, and the simple, as opposed to the contrived, the gradual, and the elaborate, are the only truly efficacious dimensions of the path, as only these aspects are most directly rooted in the monistic, unconditioned gnosis of the pristine ground, beyond the more superficial workings of karmic cause and effect. Toward this end, the seminal heart tradition combines specially adapted forms of two doctrinal notions prevalent in earlier Indian Mahayana Buddhism namely Buddha nature theory and pure land theory, to frame its two main contemplative te techniques. These two techniques can be translated as breaking through and direct transcendence, with breaking through often presented as a foundation for direct transcendence. Breaking through involves the sudden breakthrough experience of one's own intrinsic gnosis or Buddha nature, which is commonly described in great perfection tra traditions as innate awareness construed as identical with the pristine ground.
Breaking through typically occurs through a master introducing it directly in a highly idiosyncratic dialogue or encounter tailored to the student's proclivities. This breakthrough experience, I might add, is an important source for the bare non-judgmental awareness meditation that has been co-opted by the contemporary mindfulness movement. The second practice, direct transcendence, involves deepening one's participation in the innate awareness of the ground through stimulating its expression in the form of visionary experiences of Buddhas and their Pure Land paradises. Here is an image of the practice detailing the stages in which these visionary experiences are to unfold. So it's to be read from left to right um, with the uh, first pixels and then they organize themselves into circular images and swirling rainbows until you get a full mandala on the right there. The only child of the Buddhist Tantra to which I'll now turn positions itself in a very privileged place in seminal heart cosmogony and contemplative practice. It presents itself as the very first self-resonance from the pristine ground prior to its initial misrecognition, and thus the very first text to describe the seminal heart and its unique combination of features. Oh, so this is an image of uh, really the full mandala that comes uh, through the uh, practice of direct transcendence. And you will have noticed probably that it's equivalent to, in many respects, the uh, 100 deity mandala from the Glihya Garbha Tantra that I showed you earlier. It's just a reinterpreted. So turning now to the Tantra itself, first off, its origins and transmission is not at all clear from available sources. The main reason for this lack of clarity is twofold. The first reason is that the Tantra appears in three different versions. That is, it appears in two different cycles of, of visionary revelation and in one collection of Tantras uh, that are presumed to have been translated and, and passed on not through concealment and recovery, but just uh, in normal human means like copying and passing on. <laughs> So in terms of visionary revelations, the Tantra appears in Longchenpa's 14th century seminal heart collection called the Seminal Heart in Four Parts, but without any colophon giving the details of its production or revelation. The Tantra also appears with minor textual variations in another massive collection of revelations known as the Fusion of the Guru's Realization, which is claimed to have been revealed by the 14th century treasure revealer Sangyalingpa in 1364. A third version of the Tantra, which seems to be based on the seminal heart in four parts version, also appears in some editions of the collection of old school Tantras. This is a massive collection, uh, first compiled in the 15th century, of all the old school Tantras whose Indian pedigree uh, were, was questioned and were therefore excluded from the mainstream translated Buddha word canon or Kangyur collections compiled over the preceding centuries. Its inclusion here and its absence of the special punctuation marking treasure revelations, which I can't show you now, but there's a special punctuation that sort of marks what's supposed to be designated as treasure revelation from other kinds of texts, suggests that it was considered by this collection's compilers as a text translated from Sanskrit, although there's not much evidence to support this. Indeed, the historical and text critical evidence suggests that the Tantra actually first appeared sometime between the 13th and the 14th centuries. And I'm not going to get into the details of, of how I came to this, but it's tentative, so um, you can take it with a grain of salt, really. <laughs> Moreover, a broader survey of the seminal heart literature and seminal heart derived treasure revelations further suggests that simplifications of the sprawling seminal heart corpus had become an urgent desideratum by the 14th century. By then, as Lonchempa relates in the Seminal Heart in Four Parts collection that he compiled, it was imperative to rein in this corpus, both to rescue it from obscurity and to ease its future promulgation and practice. Now, mind you, these were tantras, 17 tantras, each with thousands of pages of commentary and multiple ancillary texts. So, he, you know, you can imagine the sprawling sort of nature of the corpus. In a, in a series of titles that seems to emphasize its complex, complex role as summary, 
vehicle and seed of the seminal heart tradition, the Tantra alternatively refers to itself throughout its versions as the only child of all teachings, the only child of all Buddhas, the all illuminating sun, essence of gold, the Tantra that liberates through wearing, the crown seed Tantra and the single white panacea. The promise this text makes to confer liberation through wearing it, preferably as an amulet worn on the head, around the neck, or under the armpit, is of course a venerable Buddhist theme rooted in Mahayana texts like the Mahapratisara and other Indian Buddhist amulet texts whose origins perhaps stretch all the way back to the advent of writing down Buddhist scriptures and circulating them in physical textual format. This theme of liberation through affixing on one's body a physical book first appears most conspicuously in the seminal heart literature in the penetrating sound tantra, considered the main tantra among the 17 seminal heart tantras revealed in the 12th century. Now the second reason for this tantra's uh, origin, that this tantra's origin and historical trajectory are quite murky, is that as a tantra it claims that it was neither composed nor even compiled in the first place. Indeed it, indeed, it even refers to itself throughout as a self-arisen statement, claiming that it was not produced through any form of agency whatsoever, but rather emerged spontaneously at the beginning of time itself, prior to the bifurcation of existence into samsara and nirvana, purity and impurity, happiness and suffering, gnosis and ignorance, and all the other dualities. This moment, the Tantra asserts, was before all thoughts, which, according to the logic of the seminal heart, was before Gnosis had misrecognized itself and strayed into duality. The traditional narratives in the seminal heart in four parts collection corroborate the idea that this tantra was the very first great perfection teaching, the self-resonance of reality itself, which in turn served as the basis for penet the penetrating sound tantra and the other 17 seminal heart tantras. These narratives relate the cosmogonic unfolding of worlds, beings, and Buddhist teachings with recourse to Buddhist three-body theory. From the Dharmakaya sphere of the pristine ground of Samantabhadra and Samantabhadri's primordial union, pictured here, very beautifully, I think, to the emergence of Gnostic Sambhogakaya expressions in the form of the five Buddhas, five, Buddha, uh, five consorts in the mandala of 100 Pacific and fierce deities, pictured here once again, on to the myriad further expressions of Gnostic Nirmanakaya forms and all diversified phenomena. According to this cosmogony, the profusion of awakened forms sounds sensory perceptions and concepts experienced in our lived world have in fact never strayed from the originally awakened pristine ground, but only seem to be separate due to adventitious defilements driven by Gnosis' misrecognition of itself. In this schema, the only child of the Buddha's tantra is alternatively located as the first expression of awakened speech on the Sambhogakaya level or on the Nirmanakaya level. However, the Tantra unequivocally refers to itself as the first nirmanakaya or emanation body to emerge from the dynamic unfolding of the pristine ground gnosis. Complicating matters further, the only child of the Buddhas served in its own right as the basis for further literary production, not just on the abstract theoretical level, but in the form of actual texts that elaborate directly on the contents and aims of the Tantra. The Tantra is followed in both revelatory collections, Sangi Limpa's fusion of the Guru's realization and Lon Chempa's seminal heart in four parts, by extensive commentaries and other associated texts, some of which are unique to each collection and some of which are in common. First, each collection contains immediately after the Tantra a word-by-word -word commentary. These two commentaries are strikingly similar, but not similar enough to really be considered two different recensions of the same text but more research really awaits to determine their relationship, in fact. Moreover, their authorial or revelatory attribution varies considerably. The one in Sangi Lingpa's fusion of the guru's realization is once again attributed to the revelatory output of Sangi Lingpa, of course. The word-by-word -word commentary in Longchampa's seminal heart in four parts commentary is not construed as a tre treasure revelation at all 
but is simply attributed to the authorship of Garab Dorje, the Indian figure shrouded in mystery, who I mentioned earlier, who stands at the beginning of the human great perfection lineage. The attribution of this commentary to Garab Dorje would, of course, date the Tantra's revelation to the very origins of the seminal heart tradition among humans, like way back in the seventh century, right? However, as I said, there's considerable evidence that did not appear until much later, so that kind of complicates the lineage history a little bit. Both collections also contain another short tantra, roughly 15 folios in length, which is really the same text, notwithstanding a few minor textual variations. In both collections, this tantra refers to itself as the instruction on the only child of all Buddhist tantra, the natural praiseworthy statement taught by the teacher Vajradhara called ascertaining the vital point of the occasion. Now, in the lineage histories, Vajradhara is the one who taught the Tantra to Vajrapani and Vajrasattva before they, in turn, gave it to Garb Dorje. So it's sort of taking the lineage back a step further, even. So this Tantra, like the only child of the Buddhist Tantra, also appears in some collection of old-school Tantra's comp compilations. So once again, kind of complicating the picture a little bit more, that they're not really, it's not a revelation at all, maybe. The subsequent tradition would simply refer to this tantra as ascertaining the vital point of the occasion, and it would be popularly cited in, uh, all the way through the 19th, 20th century. Cast in the voice of the Buddha Vajradhara, this tantra directly situates the only child of all Buddhist tantra in the context of a broad range of mainstream Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhist practices and aims. It opens with brief directives for how to fashion the only child of all Buddhist tantra in a sm into a small booklet and wear it as an amulet, followed by more elaborate instructions for when and how to most effectively recite it to address a whole range of pragmatic and transcendent concerns. These range from quelling earthquakes, crop-threatening frost, famine and epidemics and illnesses among humans and livestock, to entering the path to liberation and acquiring the qualities of a Vajra holder or a Vajra master, all the way to attaining complete awakening. It's all through reciting uh, the Tantra. Not this Tantra, but the one before. <laughs> In so doing, it also prescribes associated actions to ensure efficacy, such as the propitiation and invocation of deities, the freeing of animals that would other otherwise be slaughtered, the cultivation of subtle wind energies in the subtle body through yogic practice, and the recognition of intrinsic non-dual cognition, all interwoven with those aims. But it nonetheless concludes with the promise that since the Tantra is itself a nirmanakaya, or an awakened emanation body, simply wearing it will confer Buddhahood without any of that other stuff, regardless of the, war the wearer's moral condition, uh, gender, or experience with contemplation. Now, neither Longchenpa's Seminal Heart in Four Parts nor the collection of old school tantras contain any further texts directly connected with the only child of the Buddhas. However, Sangye Lingpa's fusion of the Guru's realization includes an additional five texts connected with the tantra. The first one is instructions for redacting the text into the form of an amulet titled the short text for drawing the circle that liberates through wearing. Second is a more elaborate commentary attributed to Padmasambhava as author and Sangye Lingpa as revealer called the 10-topic supportive text for liberation through wearing. Third, a brief manual for redacting the Tantra into a set of mantra images to be pasted on a threshold or another public place for all to see, titled Liberation Through Seeing, Deliverer from Samsara. Fourth, a diagram that outlines the specifications of the former, called Sequence of the Diagram. So this is kind of, those two go together, obviously. And five, a much more elaborate commentary attributed once again to the authorship of Padmasambhava and the revelatory genius of Sangilimpa titled The Synoptic Supportive Teaching Subsuming the Attended Meaning. So for Sangilimpa, much more than for Lonchempa, the short tantra, the only child of the Buddhas, begat its own offspring, resulting in a veritable family of texts that include detailed liturgical instructions, contemplative instructions, and manuals for how to redact the Tantra into amulets and diagrams that promise to liberate through wearing or seeing them. This gave rise to two different amulet traditions that are still widely practiced today. The seminal heart in four parts tradition of writing the entire Tantra out in the form of a tiny booklet. Here is a picture of what this looks like, actually. This is a this is the entire text written out in gold on blue, and it's enclosed within a little plastic sleeve that you can kind of put a string around and carry it with you. 
Oh. And the other tradition is the Sangye Lingpa tradition, in which only the Tantra's sixth chapter is incorporated into a number of other related mantras and diagrams. The mantra for this, or the template for this diagram is pictured here. It's so elaborate. Uh, it was a great photo, but uh, <laughs> the one on the left there is so elaborate. The one on the right, this is uh, the mantras that are kind of um, taken out from the center of the left image and put on the back as part of a consecration. Um, now this is a close-up. Uh, you can see the detail there. The sixth chapter, the aims of the sixth chapter that I'm describing, they're all written in these little circles that go all the way around. And then the mantras that accompany them in the chapter are written below and above and in different parts. As you can see how incredibly elaborate it is. And it would be um, consecrated, folded up, and, and worn. So, and here is uh, the image of the um, liberation through seeing diagram, <clears throat> excuse me, based once again on the mantras from the sixth chapter. So um, take a good look. <laughs> so despite the prevalence of two different amulet traditions, by the 19th, by the 19th century, the Tantra's attribution to Sangi Lingpa as its revealer seems to have won out over its attribution to the earlier seminal heart revealers. However, on, upon comparing the Sangi Lingpa version with the versions in the seminal heart in four parts and the collection of old school Tantra's versions, and looking into Sangi Lingpa's autobiographical account of his own visionary revelations, uh, it doesn't... Uh, look as though um, Sangi Lingpo's version was actually the first one at all. Um, he doesn't mention it at all in his own autobiographical account, and um, there are text critical reasons to believe that it's actually, the Sangi Lingpa version is based on the prior version that's in the um, Seminal Heart in Four Parts collection. So as circumstance would have it actually, Sangye Lingpa's revelation of the fusion of the Guru's realization, in, in which the Tantra is included, took place in 1364. It's a significant date because that's the date, uh, that's the year that Longchenpa in fact passed away. So in the 17th century, moreover, the fifth Dalai Lama seemed to pick up on the problematic attribution as he casted doubts on the authenticity of prophecies from Sangye Lingpa's fusion of the Guru's realization, claiming that his students had inserted false prophecies into the cycle to draw unwarranted suspicion upon a rival treasure revealer. So it's not difficult to imagine that the fifth Dalai Lama might have also had in mind this dual attribution of the only child of the Buddhas as well. So turning now to the contents of the Tantra itself, although as I already mentioned, the only child of the Buddhas appears to have been intended to provide a simplification of the sprawling architecture of the seminal heart tradition, condensing it into a single short pithy series of statements, the Tantra itself claims to be, of course, as I also mentioned, that the very foundation of the seminal heart tradition. When reading through the Tantra, we find that its main theme is, in fact, simplicity and naturalness and their relationship with elaboration and contrivance on several interrelated levels. The Tantra is neatly divided into seven different sections or chapters, but only in the Sangye Lingpa version are these explicitly marked. That's part of the evidence for its kind of later date. The Tantra itself gives no chapter titles in any of its variants, but the two, any of its versions, but the two word-by-word -word commentaries are in nearly perfect agreement on the following general topical divisions. The greatness of the Tantra, in which the Tantra's virtues are described in some detail. How the Tantra spread the lineage of the Buddha, in which the proliferation of the Tantra among Buddhas is described. How it will later emerge, in which its transmission among humans is described how it is to be practiced in this lifetime, which details in a very condensed format the entire path of practice according to the seminal heart tradition, common activities, which describes preliminary and ancillary practices to be performed in support of the path laid out in section four, the heart of liberation through only wearing, which lists a series of mantras and their aims, which I pointed out are part of that amulet, actually, that are incorporated into it, and chapter seven, how this tantra is unconditioned, 
So unconditioned Tantra, meaning no one formed it, no authorship, which reiterates the thrust of chapter one, emphasizing its unauthored, spontaneously self-arisen character. So I'd like to zero in briefly on the major theme of the Tantra, the undulation between simplicity and naturalness on the one hand and complexity and contrivance on the other. This undulation, which unfolds throughout the text, is most often keyed with reference to a specific term, ch. The term ch appears 58 times in this short tantra, which, mind you, is only between 30 and 38 foliocides in length, depending on the spacing of the versions consulted. The Tibetan term ch has a semantic range that uh, includes elaborate phenomenal characteristics, thoughts, actions, or words in which it might be rendered best as elaboration or complexity. It is also the past tense of the verb tro, which means to spread, expand, elaborate, or even radiate, used with light. In Tibetan translation, tru typically, in, in Tibetan translation of Sanskrit, uh, the word tru typically renders the Sanskrit term prapancha, which has a similar range of meanings as the nominal sense of tru, but also the more technical sense of conceptual structuring or dualistic conceptual structuring as John Donne renders it. There's several experts here, so you can take uh, qualms with this translation if you like. And uh, this um, underlies and gives impetus to the emergence of coarser and more superficial dualistic thoughts, this, this particular term true. It's sort of the underlying conceptual structuring in uh, Buddhist philosophical texts often. In this technical sense, it often features in the phrase chuchal, freedom from conceptual, conceptual structuring, sometimes rendered as freedom from mental elaboration. There's other ways of rendering it that are perhaps more eloquent. Whereas in the phrase chume, it tends to mean generally uh, absence of elaboration or just simplicity. So to give a rough sense of the importance of the term tru in the broader tradition of the seminal heart, by the time of Lonchampa's 14th century seminal heart in four parts collection, all the tantra's initiations had been organized according to the following fourfold structure. So you have uh, elaborate, uh, truche, simple, trume, very simple, shindu trume, and utterly simple, raptu trume. This scale of elaboration and simplicity refers to the relative level of elaboration of ritual complexity of the initiation ritual itself, including the number of deities involved in the initiation, the complexity of their mandala palace, the relative presence or absence of other accoutrements and substances, and so on. Here, the distinct levels of elaboration are pitched as intended for different kinds of beings and what might be most called for in addressing their individual proclivities. In the Tantra, the term tr is used in all these senses and more. To start with, in chapter one, the text describes itself not as a mantra statement derived from having strayed, which would be the purpose of uh, all Buddhist practice, really, to kind of uh, rectify this straying, um, but as a tantra that was emanated by spreading forth from the original ground before having strayed. So this referring to that initial misrecognition of the ground gnosis's misrecognition of itself. So this refers to that originally awakened nature of existence prior to the ground gnosis misrecognizing itself in the first cosmogonic movement that results in duality and eventually, if I can find the page, all phenomenal existence. This statement casts the Tantra as the natural resonance of Gnosis itself prior to the bifurcation of language and experience into signifier and signified. As such, the Tantra presents itself throughout the first and seventh chapters as the Gnostic germinal matrix of all forms of language and modes of phenomenal existence whatsoever. In the Tantra's own words, it is the seminal matrix of Gnosis, quote, appearing automatically at the beginning of all aeons as a great self-arisen text, which composed itself from the blessings or the, bless the power, perhaps, of the three awakened bodies without having been written or composing, composed by any form of agency whatsoever. The opening narrative frame of the Tantra sets the scene for this understanding with the rather unusual formulation, 
for such a text, a tantra or a sutra. Thus have I and billions of Buddhas said and taught countlessly with our very own realization, precisely according to the essence of awakened mind at one time. <laughs> Before nirvana, this genuine singular mo node, the very essence of what is ascertained as the seeds of reality was spoken and taught. It's only in the commentaries that we find the first person singular here, thus have I, glossed as Samantabhadra, the primordial Buddha, who in union with Samantabhadri serves as the pristine ground of all phenomenal existence. It was with the, the blue and the white uh, deities in union that I showed you earlier, that image. While this gloss accords well with the theme of the Tantra as a child of the Buddhas, the Tantra also has the alternative title of the Crown Seed Tantra, thus clearly re referencing the Tantra's reproductive potency. See, according to tantric physiology absorbed in the seminal heart tradition, seminal fluid resides in the crown of the head. This association becomes all the more pregnant with meaning, sorry, that's a horrible joke, with, uh, when taking into consideration that the term great perfection was also used early on to mean the tantric sacrament of a drop of seminal fluid to be consumed during consecration or initiation. This generative character of the Tantra also has clear implications for the nature and function of standard Tantric practice. In the words of the Tantra's first chapter, this Tantra is the underlying principle of deity and mantra, the generative field of all mandalas, the astringent that purifies incorrect deity meditation, the ground in which the essence of instructions is perfected, perfecting the enumerations of the Vajra vehicle, the Vajrayana. It is the singular all-encompassing sphere which brings all beings onto the path. The first and final chapters drive this point home by mentioning that there has never in fact been a Buddha to become awakened without practicing this tantra. Quite a claim. The theme of generative potency through emanation and elaboration from a singular simple matrix takes off in the second chapter when describing how the Tantra was first emanated at the very beginning of a number of successive aeons as the natural resonance of each age's primordial Buddha, and how it functioned in turn to spread the lineage or family line of the Buddhas in those various ages. So true that Tibetan term that I mentioned earlier, in its verbal sense of radiate, emanate, and so forth, appears in nearly every verse in this chapter. Each of the chapter's verses follows the same pattern. It narrates the primordial Buddha of the aeon and the aeon itself, what the Tantra was various call, variously called in each age, and the staggering number of beings that reached awakening through it then. The Tantra is crystal clear that it stands as the first and simplest form to manifest from the pristine ground of awakening. Throughout the verses, it is variously termed the seminal mandala, the actual mudra, the mudra free of complexity, the circle of the sublime matrix, simple self-resonating matrix, seed of awakened wisdom, mandala of original mind essence, pure essence of the seminal heart root tantras, Root of all mandalas, mudra of the true protector, and several other similar titles. Through this litany, the tantra correlates the language of the tantra with the basic pristine nature of tantric deities, their mandala palaces, mudras, scriptures, and all the other elements of standard tantric Buddhist practice. Chapter 3 of the tantra carries this theme of origin and proliferation to a later time, by detailing how other Buddhist vehicles and teachings, not just the seminal heart teachings, but the entire range of Buddhist sutras, tantras, and treatises, including all their mantras, categories, philosophical arguments, and so on, all in fact emanate from the blessing or the power of this tantra in order to put a stop to various attachments and impediments to the understanding that one has in fact never veered from the pristine ground but only falsely imagined so through being subject to various levels of misconception driven by previous physical, verbal, and mental habits. Chapter four and five, how to practice in this lifetime and common activities unfolds in germinal form the entire seminal heart path. Chapter four discusses the main seminal heart practices it begins with cursory instructions for the practice of differentiating between samsara and nirvana, presented here as a preparation for breakthrough contemplation. I'm not going to go into the details of this. 
Uh, it's very interesting, though. You should look it up yourself. <laughs> it then gives a single short line on the famous pointing out instruction of, the, of breakthrough contemplation, in which a master introduces a student to the nature of intrinsic non-dual cognition, the pristine ground, and ideally, of course, recognizes it. Without skipping a beat, the Tantra goes on to detail, again in a very condensed format, the contemplative practice of direct transcendence intended to deepen immersion in intrinsic non-dual awareness through invoking direct visionary experiences with its pure phenomenal expressions by staring directly into a cloudless sky. Now this can happen in a dark retreat situation too when all, um, all sources of light are completely uh, cut off or in manipulating light sources and so forth. So it's just particular to this text that we have staring into a cloudless sky. Anyone who sees these visions, the Tantra promises, becomes equal in fortune to the original Samantabhadra. This instance, interestingly, stands out as the text's only mention of Samantabhadra. The Tantra takes up more space tracing the emergence of these visionary expressions of intrinsic non-dual cognition from the initial emergence of dots and pixels to their organization into swirling clusters and their formation into Buddha bodies and the multiplication of these Buddha bodies from 1 to 5 to 10 to 15 and so on until the expression of the entire mandala of innate gnosis fills one's visual field. That was uh, part of what I showed you earlier with that... Um, kind of panel showing that sequence, yeah? So chapter five, common activities, is what it's called, doubles back to describe another set of practices intended to serve as preliminaries and ancillaries for the main breakthrough and direct transcendent practices. These include, in order, the cultivation of an acute sense of the impermanence of life, contemplation of the sounds of the elements of earth, water, fire, and wind, mingling the visionary exp experiences of direct transcendence with sleep and lucid dreaming, dreaming, sexual yoga practice, and the concoction of ointments and other medicinal materials for application to the eyes and other sense faculties. Interestingly, the Tantra's instructions for the path are really far too terse to really follow them on their own. They seem rather to be intended to serve as a mnemonic device for those who already learned them, or to provide impetus for future commentarial elaboration. The ambiguity allows the commentaries to latch onto some of the more opaque verses in the chapter to integrate also the standard Buddhist tantric path of generation and perfection phase contemplations centered on deity yoga and the subtle body to argue how those two, when yoked to the great perfection orientation, can yield fruit in fewer years than usual. Moreover, even as the Tantra itself never, never once actually mentions the 100 deity mandala of Pacific and fierce deities that I've been showing you uh, as the quintessential expression of intrinsic non-dual gnosis that would become a common feature of the seminal heart tradition in general, the commentaries refer to it as such repeatedly. For its part, the Tantra's part, it only mentions that it is the source of all deities and their mandalas. It does not single out which ones or otherwise privilege a particular expression over others beyond its single mention of Samantabhadra. Chapter 6, titled in the commentaries, The Essence of Liberation Through Wearing, lists a series of mantras along with the aim that each is intended to affect, as I described. Only some of the mantra expressions are obviously derived from Sanskrit terms, however. The rest is a combination of words of unknown origin and Tibetan. The aims of these mantras include things like repealing attachment to the faculties, repealing attachment to the aggregates, repealing attachment to all objects, incinerating the objects of mind, churning the depths of samsara, and so on. These were the little, those aims are, are written out on the amulet within those little circles that I showed you before. The Tantra, however, itself nowhere gives directions to use the mantra corresponding to each aim in the redaction of an amulet, as the chapter title in the commentaries, Essence of Liberation Through Wearing, clearly implies. It is only in the commentaries and other ancillary texts that we get explicit instructions to do so. The result is the elaborate diagrams that I've just shown you or shown you earlier. So um, getting to uh, some concluding remarks here, I'd like to offer uh, first um, just to point out that the Tantra's self-presentation has important implications for the pivotal role it has played in the broader seminal heart tradition. 
not only does this tantra simplify the seminal heart corpus by, subsu by subsuming it in abridged form, it also expresses theories of cosmogony, language, embodiment, and deity, in which the relationship between simplicity and elaboration features as the explicit theme. With its repeated usages of the term chu, Throughout its range of valences, the Tantra positions itself at the origin of all texts, bodies, deities, and mandalas. In this, it provides a foundational charter for its performative use in the manufacture of diagrams and amulets, poising it to function on levels beyond the register of abstract theory to reach a much wider audience. Indeed, as the natural resonance of reality itself the Tantra presents itself as a fusion of form and content, steeped in gnosis. This theoretically allows one to partake of that reality, not only through reading and comprehending the Tantra's propositional content. It implies also that the written or auditory form of the scripture in and of itself will also have potent effects when copied, recited, and most importantly, worn, beyond whatever its propositional content might convey. In this, the Tantra bridges the discursive and performative functions of language, enabling its words to work on the reader, listener, or wearer, as the case may be, on multiple registers, spanning pragmatic and transcendent aims. The importance of this dynamic in both theorizing and performing the undulation between simplification and elaboration for the seminal heart tradition is also readily apparent when we pan back out to consider this Tantra's mysterious origin, peculiar historical trajectory, and widespread popularity to the present. From this vantage point, we can see that the Tantra likely functioned to condense the seminal heart literature into what was deemed its most seminal form, and, a, and at a particularly crucial point in its transmission during the 13th or 14th centuries. Precisely when the seminal heart corpus was becoming too diffuse in terms of its sheer volume and its porous boundaries with other revelatory cycles. Historical evidence suggests that the kind of simplification that this tantra enacted was particularly compelling. It likely led Sangye Lingpa's circle of students to incorporate it into their master's cycle and posthumously attribute it to his revelatory prowess. And other old school figures also wanted to take part as they mimicked its theme for inclusion in their own visionary cycles and also included the Tantra in their broader collections of Tantras and treasure revelations. That's not part of what I presented, but you have to take my word for it that this, is, this theme of the only child of the Buddhas, even if it's not the same text, was kind of replicated again and again in the 14th century among other uh, treasure revealers. In each case, but especially with Sangye Lingpa's cycle, its simplicity formed the basis for the production of further commentarial literature, associated texts, and perhaps most importantly, amulets, the wearing of which continues to this day. In this way, the Tantra's theory of elaboration and absorption provided a blueprint for its position within the history of the seminal heart transmission, explaining in doctrinal terms how it functions as both the simplest condensation of and the germinal matrix for all the awakened Buddhas, mandalas, and scriptures of Buddhism as a whole. I hope that this foray into the nature and history of the only child of the Buddhas has uh, shown that at least in this kernel of the seminal heart tradition, it is impossible and indeed unthinkable to disentangle intrinsic non-dual cognition or bare awareness, as it's now called in mindfulness circles, from its myriad manifestations and broader contexts. As the Tantra itself tells us, it is the perpetual undulation from simple to elaborate and back again that animates this tradition. And I suspect that this dialectical interplay between simplification and elaboration also presents us with a key for how we might interpret the historical dynamism of other Buddhist traditions as well. Thank you very much for your time and attention.